you have your Bibles, would you open them to uh, Mark chapter number 14. Mark 14, we're going to begin. Uh, this is another one of our sermons as we're looking towards this series on knowing what our spiritual disciplines are and why those things are important to us and uh, walking them out uh, in our daily life. So if you uh, have your copy of God's Word, if you wouldn't mind standing with us in honor of reading God's Word, in Mark chapter number 14, in verse number 32. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. If I spoke to those in the room, for most of the ones that are watching online, if I just simply said the word Gethsemane, you would know the place, and you would know uh, what would happen in that place. For many people, they uh, do not know that, though. And we need to understand that we know of Gethsemane, not because of the place, but because of the importance of what happened there and the importance of what it was in Jesus' life. Look what it says. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. The, the other disciples, the 12, the, all of them, or the 11, they came with Jesus to this place. And he took Peter and James and John with him. <clears throat> and he began to be troubled and deeply depressed. Distressed, excuse me. So he took three of them away from the rest of the group and went a little further out, but he had something that he wanted them to be a part of that too. Now knowing all that was ahead of him, the cross that was ahead, he began to be distressed in his heart. Verse 34, then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to, even to death. Stay here and watch. That word watch is very important. He's literally saying to him, stay here, but be very aware. Be, be watching and know. Uh, be very, something alarming is very, very, very much about to happen. But I want you to know it and be ready for it, all right? Prepare yourself is really what he is saying. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. He knew that. He was the Son of God. He knew that anything that God wanted, God could do. Then he was very honest, and he said, take this cup away from me. Now, this is a proclamation that unless it was the, the will of God to do otherwise, God would have obeyed. And Jesus knew that. And he is saying, this is the human flesh will that I have. I do not want to have to walk down this road. I do not want to have to bear this cup. Nevertheless, not, that I, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Simon, could you not take one hour and be alert and ready? And prepare. Could you not watch with me? Just one hour. Watch him pray, lest you enter into temptation. He's asking them to really to pray for himself and for what he's about to go through. But he is saying, This is important for you too. You need to watch him pray because if not, you will fall into temptation. And Peter most definitely was. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he knew that their spirit wanted to do it, but the fleshly desire was not disciplined enough to follow through with it. And here is the, the, the balance that we need to find in our life, is our spirit who seeks God and our flesh that wants to seek its own will, they must both come under the, the will and the control and the leadership of God so that we actually do what our spirit desires us to do. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. He came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let's pray once again. Father, we do ask you, O oh Lord, by the power that is invested in you, that, the, that comes from your presence, Lord, we ask that you 
invite us into your presence today. We ask, oh Lord, that you call us by name. Lord, that uh, we would hear your voice. And Lord, we would hear the voice of wisdom and your will and for our best and for our good. Father, we don't know what we need, but you know what we need. So Lord, in the next few moments, speak to us personally. Lord, we need change from who we are to who you are and the plans that you have for us. Father, we've gathered together in your name. We're here because of that. We're listening because of that. Lord, meet us at our place of need because we know that you love us so very much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The church is defined as being a part of a body of believers. We are the believers of the New Holland Baptist Church. The word means called out and, and, and as we're called together. And that's who we are. All around this city, this community, there are churches that will people will are they're members of. They're, they're part of that body of believers and they will gather together and worship. During this time, we are ask, actually asking people to come and to worship with us, but we're also asking them to join us online so that we can be together. And it's different when you're in the room than it is online, but we're doing everything that we can to, so that we as a body of believers can gather together. But really, a church is more than just the body of believers. It is the body of Christ. And it's a group of people that gather together in the name and the will of Christ. We seek Him. We want to do His will. We, we want to do whatever it is that God would, has called us to do. What does it mean to be part of the body of Christ? What does it look like? Well, number one, we, we, um, uh, it begins with a personal relationship with Christ. Everything begins when you choose that personal relationship with God. It begins by admitting what separates you from God, and that's your personal sin. God is a holy God. He can't have a relationship with sin. So your sin separates you from God. And then we put our belief and our trust in Jesus Christ, that he's the Redeemer who came to forgive us of our sins, where we can have a relationship with him. And we confess that we're not able to do this on our own, but we need his help. We need to follow him and follow his direction that he has from, for our lives. It's an important life-changing decision. We now know that everything, everything in our lives depends upon that relationship with him. It is a one-time decision that we choose every day. It's a one-time decision. I mean, you come to that place when you feel the leadership and the drawing of God upon your life. You know you have sinned. You know that that sin separates you from God. You believe that he's God's son who came and died on the cross of Calvary for your sins so that he could take your dirty, rotten sins and you could have the righteousness of God. He became sin, your sin, and you can become his righteousness. And then you confess that the only way you can have that is is by this relationship with him. So it's a one-time fact. It's a one-time decision that you choose to follow every day. Now, I'm not saying you get saved every day. I'm not saying you have to be born again every day or you have to choose to invite the Lord into your heart every day. No, it's a one-time decision. But every day, are you listening? We have to make that decision again. We've got to make that decision that we're going to follow him. It, we cannot say like many do, well, I've made my decision, so I'm good now, and I'm just going to do what I think's right and best. No. You've got to follow his will. You've got to seek after him. You've got to be willing to walk in the way that God would have you to walk. And you've got to continuously seek repentance in your life because you're continuously going to sin. And you've got to continuously seek growth in your life because we're part of his body. And God wants this for us, so much so that Jesus modeled this for us. Jesus lived a life of knowing God, believing God, trusting from God, and yet needing to hear from him every day, needing to uh, abide with him every day, needing to 
know God's will for his life every day and be willing to submit to that. Jesus chose that. So we need to follow him and we need to do his will. We need to make that decision every day. Jesus had a Gethsemane. On the night, Jesus' most important night, I, how do you say that one night was more important to the other? But we know the cross was coming the next day. And he gathered together with that little band of disciples and, and he met in Jerusalem in a very room, it was called the upper room, second story room, and it was a big room, it was an open room where all of them could gather together and they had a meal together and, and Jesus began to talk with them and, and he had a, a lesson that he wanted to show them and we know it today as communion or the, the Lord's Supper where he took the bread and broke it, symbolizing what would happen in just a few hours on the cross where he would, his body would be broken. And he took the cup representing his blood that would be shed to teach them that lesson, to teach them the story of salvation once again. And then he knew one would betray him. He looked, he told them, one of you is going to betray me. One of them would ask, the next one would ask. And Judas asked and said, Lord, is it me? And he said, what you do, do quickly. And Judas got up from the room and left because he had made an agreement to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. And he went out and met that mob of soldiers because he had arranged that he would take them to where Jesus was, where they could, they could uh, find him and take him away and try him. But Jesus was there with the disciples in the upper room Many people have asked, well, why did he leave? Well, he needed to get out of Jerusalem. I mean, when this, he knew the soldiers were going to come. And they didn't need to, to find him in a place where there would really be a riot or something like that that would happen, an uproar. So he needed to go to a, a private and a secluded place. So he took his disciples and went out of Jerusalem and down the Kidron Valley and back up the other hill to a garden of olive trees, mature olive trees where... The roots are the kind that grow on the top of the ground, so to speak. And, and there, where it was his custom, he went. And he stayed with his disciples there. And he said to some of them, stay here. But he asked Peter, James, and John to go with him a little further. And he said, what? sit, stay, and, and watch while I go away and pray. I think that we need to understand here what Jesus was doing was he knew that he needed to spend time with the Father. He needed strength for the journey. He needed to make sure that his will was submitted to the Father's will because when other people are being so very rude and mean and, and, and beating him and slapping him and spitting in his face, he needed to make sure that he did not react in his will but surrender his will to God's will. And he invited others with him to follow this spiritual discipline of prayer and seeking the face of the Father. Now please hear this. Judas knew where he was. When he went and got the soldiers and they got their torches, he said, I know exactly where he will be. Why? Because it was Jesus' custom when he was in that area, to spend time with the Father. It was, a, it was a thing that he would do all the time. So Judas, he knew exactly where to go to find him. I mean, it's not like Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. And by the way, you know where I'll be. I'll be in the garden when you come with the soldiers. He didn't have to say that. Judas knew the pattern of Jesus' life. Jesus, Judas knew the pattern that, that Jesus was always about getting alone and praying, pouring out his heart to God. What it would wonderfully be if we could live a life so transparent before others that others could see 
the spiritual disciplines in our life. Some of those things, that, those spiritual disciplines that we're going to learn about, we know that we're going to have to do them privately, but some of them we're going we're to do together. And by the way, you're going to make a decision in, the, in today and in the weeks that are ahead, and you're going to decide if you are going to follow these spiritual disciplines in your personal life. You're going to have to make that decision for yourself. And some of you may say, well, I, I, I choose to do this, but I, I, I would feel more comfortable if I just did it privately on my own. Listen, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it Christ's way. If we're going to follow the model, we're going to follow the total model of what Christ did. Not my will, not what I think is best, but what Jesus lived out in his life and ask us as believers to follow him. Follow his will and his way. And that's what we must do in our life. Let's be clear. Jesus prioritized time with the Father, and he did things every day that were so very important so that that time would be intentional, real, and alive. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter number 18. When I was preparing for this, this is one of those times that I was just in my daily quiet time. And, and the Lord said, oh, by the way, when you get to uh, that, that sermon on finding your Gethsemane in your life, I, this is one of the scriptures that I want you to highlight. I would have never found this on my own. I would have never highlighted this scripture if it had not been for the Holy Spirit saying, this is what they need to look at and know how they need to pattern their life, how they need to have those spiritual disciplines in their life. So when we get to Matthew 18, we need to remember that in Matthew 16, the disciples for the first time looked to Jesus and said these words, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you are the coming king, ruler of the world. It's prophesied in the Old Testament, we know it, we believe God's word, we believe it's going to be fulfilled in you. So we confess that you're the Messiah, you're the Christ, you're the anointed one, you're the king of all kings. And every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. Those things that we know, they were saying at that particular point in time. But then when we get to Matthew 17, Jesus said these words. He, he said, um, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. So listen. They've just confessed that he's going to be the ruler of the world. And they're looking ahead, like in Scripture, that it's prophesied in the Old Testament. We look at it today. They, we understand the church age, where you and I as individuals come and we accept Jesus one by one, one heart at a time, one decision of each individual. And there, but there is coming a day, and we know and believe. And by the way, I think it could be soon. I think it could be real soon. When Jesus will come back, he'll call his bride home, and, and there will be a time of what the Bible says is great tribulation. And by the way, if it's more tribulation than what we see on the earth today, it truly is great tribulation. But then after the end of that seven years, he'll come back and he'll rule this world. Jesus will be the ruler, the king of all the world. Amen? Amen. But they were looking for that day. They didn't see the suffering Savior on the cross. So even though Jesus was telling them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and they're going to put me on a cross, and they're going to murder me, but don't worry, three days later I will, I will be resurrected. Their mind and their heart was really drifting to this Christ, Messiah, anointed one, ruler of the world. He is the king. So, you know, we all, as humans, have this in us that we would like success. We all dream of of, of having significance. We all dream of, of wanting the best of the world, and we like to have the world by the tail, so to speak, and we like to have the attention of everyone, and we're, we like to be in control. And Amen? I mean, let's just be honest. We all want to, to succeed and have the best at it. And these disciples, it was, it was easy for them to think of, if he's the Christ, if he's going to rule the world, what does that say about me? So when we get to Matthew 18, look what it says in verse number 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
What does it mean to be great? What does it mean to be successful? What does it look like? And by the way, Lord, who's next in line? You remember the time when James and John uh, with their mom went to Jesus and, I mean, they got her involved in it too and said, uh, Lord, when you come in your kingdom, can my boys, one be at the right hand and one at the left? You remember that? I mean, they, there was something about them that wanted that self-promotion in their own life. They wanted to be in charge. They were like, hey, we'd like to be the vice president. I mean, Lord, if you want to take a vacation day, we can step in and run things for a while. That's kind of how, Lord, in your kingdom, who's going to be the greatest? And then Jesus did something there. Look in verse 2. Jesus called a little child to him. Most likely, are you listening? A toddler. Y- y'all know the age when they're, they get to walk. and they, They're not walking great yet, but they're walking. Every now and again, they kind of fall back on their diaper. I mean, they're not ready to go run the 100-yard dash. But, but they're just learning. They're just growing. They're just starting to, to, to learn how, how to do things a little bit. And he, he, he calls this little toddler, and he sits it down in their midst. Hear these words. Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child, listen to this, is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He answered their question. He said, you want to learn? You want to know? Well, let me show you. You see this child? This child is dependent. This child has nothing that he can do for me. He's a toddler. But let me tell you about this child. This child has its eyes upon me. And this child wants to spend time with me. And if I say, come here, that child's going to do everything that he can to come to him. That child's desire is to get to the father and crawl up in the father's arms. And if there's a problem, if they fall down and they're crying, they'll run to the Father to receive comfort and help. And and they don't know what to do, so they'll look to the Father and say, what should I do? How many people that I know after their physical father has left this earth said, if I could only talk to my dad again and ask advice, if I could hear his voice again, Well, listen, this is the relationship that God's called us to. He says, unless you are converted, we are born with a sin nature that separates us from God. I I don't mean to be rude here, but your sin will keep you from God. You've got to come to a place in time that you confess your sin, confess your need. He's a holy God. He can't accept sin, but he will forgive sin. And you've got to believe and trust and affirm and ask him to come in and and save you. As he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've got to invite the Lord into your life. And after you invite the Lord into your life, listen to me, humble yourself and follow me like this little child with wide-eyed wonder. Can you see a toddler and the dad says, do this, and everything in that child says, that's strange, that's crazy, but I see you and I believe you and I trust you. I will follow you. The dad's by the side of the swimming pool. and The child can't swim. The dad's down in the water and says, jump. And that child says, uh, I can't swim. And that child, but, and they're fearful. And they know that there's danger there. But the father's there, and the do- father's got his arms out and says, Come. And that child makes the decision to humble themselves and not fear the circumstance, not fear what they think might happen, but to trust and obey and believe and leap out in faith 
and find themselves in the Father's arms. Unless you're willing to be converted and humble yourself and be like this child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to me. Oh, this is so very important. To too many people, they find the place where they say, I'll pray the prayer, I, I, I want Jesus Christ to give me heaven. I'll give him my sins, and I want to be saved. But they never really become followers of Christ. Children, young children, who literally have parents who take care for them and provide for them, a lot of, a lot of at one time I heard the, heard the statistic that 94% of Christians become Christians before they're 18 years of age. If that's the great, if that's the truth still, I don't know if it's the truth still or not, but if that's the truth, great. Amen, hallelujah. But the problem is we as a body of believers need to really make sure that we teach these children what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Christ. that have been a really good place for an amen there. Would you say it's needful and necessary? Praise God for grandparents who bring their children, grandchildren. Praise God that, that we start to invest in those children because of how highly important it is. But what about the people who come to Christ as an adult? They've been living as they've been in charge of their life, but they say, Lord, I want to give you my sins. I want to give my life to you. But are we really doing everything that we can to become followers of Christ? We're going to emphasize in the weeks ahead what we need to do. All of us as believers, if we are converted and we've been born again, we're a believer in Christ, there are some things that Jesus said we need to do every day so that we can become disciples of Christ. Truly what it means to be a follower of Christ. A follower of Christ. Take your Bible and turn with me if you would to a story in the Old Testament that I think is extremely important. Daniel chapter number 6. Daniel 6. As a young teenager, Daniel was taken from the land that he had known, that he had grown up in. He was taken from his family in Israel, and he was taken the long trek to a different country known as Babylon. And he was separated from the others because they saw potential in him. And the people of Babylon, their desire, listen to me now, was to assimilate Daniel into the ways of Babylon. Satan's desire for our young people is to assimilate them into the ways of the world. So, we're trying to teach young children the ways of God. The world's trying to teach them a different way. And the world's going to teach them to, to talk like the world, dress like the world, act like the world, react like the world, have the world's priorities, the world's desires. And that's what they tried to do with Daniel. But Daniel knew God. And though he couldn't run to synagogue or temple... Though he couldn't run to his earthly parents, he still had a relationship with God and he was going to have to rely upon him and trust him and seek his leadership because he didn't have all the answers. It was going to be difficult and hard in the days that are ahead. And the, they began to say, this is the way you need to act. This is what you need to do. But Daniel began to distinguish himself because he would not be assimilated to the, to the worldless, worldly ways of Babylon, but he continued to seek the will and the face of Jehovah God, the one true God. And every time Daniel went forward, God saw that, God met him there, and God blessed him. And God gave him great favor great favor. So um, here we see in Daniel's life where, well, actually the leader of, of Babylon was a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And, and, and Daniel was distinguished among all the others and, and he blessed Nebuchadnezzar. And, and Nebuchadnezzar blessed him back to the point that even there was some very difficult things that Daniel had to say to Nebuchadnezzar at the end of his life. 
literally that he would go around and, and, and be like an animal and eat grass and grow his finger. It was terrible that he would live out in the, in the field. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar did that. But, but he came back to himself and he, he humbled himself before God, Nebuchadnezzar did. Now, Daniel didn't. All Daniel knew to do was to be faithful to God. Now Nebuchadnezzar is gone, and the Medo-Persian Empire has come in. And, and the ruler of the Medes was a man by the name of Darius. And Darius is, once again, what Babylon tried to do to the children of Israel is assimilate them in. Now Darius is trying to do the very same thing to the people of Babylon. He's trying to assimilate them into the ways of the Medes. Okay? So he puts out 120 regional leaders and he puts three governors over them so that, so that they would begin to follow his ways. Look with me, read with me in Daniel chapter number 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, that's the, those regional leaders, to be over the whole kingdom. And over those three governors of whom Daniel was one, and the Santrap, that the Santraps may, uh, might give a, account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and Santraps. Why? Because an excellent spirit was in him. Was that simply because Daniel was a great guy? Was that simply because Daniel was a great leader? Was that simply because Daniel had charisma? Was it simply because Daniel was smart? No. When it says that there was an excellent spirit in him, don't you think it was the leadership and the guidance of the Almighty God that had led him every step of the way? Had been with him since he was a teenager? Look what it says there at the end of verse 3. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. He looked at Daniel, and he was so excited for, for the excellence of this young man, he said, you know what? I might make you over the whole kingdom. The only person that would be over you is me. How does a slave from a pagan or from a, from a, a foreign land become head over two of the most powerful countries of the world to where the, the most powerful leader in all the known world says, you know, Daniel, I, I, I'm, I'm seriously thinking about making you Second in command over everything else. Daniel can't do that. Daniel can't make that happen. But let me tell you what Daniel can do. Daniel can be faithful to God and position himself with God so that God can do anything God so chooses to do with servant Daniel. Let's read on. Verse 4, so the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel according to this concerning the kingdom, but could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Oh, that that could be said about us. Amen? That the world would look and say, you know, I'd love to find some reason to, to, to complain about him, but there's just nothing he does. Matter of fact, if y'all want to complain about me, there's plenty y'all can find. Now, that was a good time not to say amen. <laughs> right? But if you want to find some fault that I've got, I've got plenty of them. They're very easily, easily seen. But oh, how wonderful it was for this young man to, to so separate himself under God and so seek God and want to follow God and be willing to obey and trust God and not fear man but fear God every day so that he was so different. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps throng, uh, throng before the king and they said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the king, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together. That's a lie. To establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. You think they're trying to flatter him? Hey, king, we've talked about it. We think it's wonderful. We just think you're doing such a great job. We, we wanted to make a decree that if anybody prays to any other God other than you or looks to any other God for a decision other than you, we think that that dirty, rotten person needs to be thrown into a den of hungry lions. How dare they ever do anything like that? 
Well, verse 8, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the de written decree. They said, do it. Put it in writing. Because in their day, in the Medo-Persian Empire, if they put the law into writing, it could not be amended. It could not be changed. Even Darius himself could not change it. Might be interesting if our world today were kind of like that. Look in verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew what it meant. He knew what it said. He knew how it would affect him. He knew that it was a death decree unless he changed his ways and assimilated to their ways. When he knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows opened, we're talking about doors, we would call them today like French doors that would open up where people on the outside could see in. With his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now listen to this. As was his custom since early days. Daniel began to seek after God when he was a teenage boy taken from his family. When he had nowhere to go, he had some place to go. When he was lonely and tired and weary, he knew where to find comfort and peace and rest. When he did not know the language and he did not know the world and, and, and he didn't know how to do, how to be faithful, every day he would get up and begin his day giving his request to God, praying to him, thanking God for him, confessing his sin to him, making sure that his life was lined up with God. And as he was going through his day and he was in the midst of his day and in the midst of the circumstances of the day, he would still take a time out and a break and say, I need to be alone. Once again, I need time with God. And at the end of his day, when the day's work had been done, he still needed the time to make sure that his heart was open to give God thanks, to praise him for being with him. This was his custom. He needed this time of abiding with the Father. How else could he make an impact? How else could he be faithful? And it did not matter that the world says, don't do it. Once the decree was written, he had to think about this. He could have gone to a private room. But if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Partial obedience will get you in trouble. Trusting him in certain areas and not trusting him in all the areas of your life. Trusting him with certain decisions when it's easy, but trusting him with all your decisions when it's hard. He had to make up his mind. So he began his day in prayer. In the middle of his day, he came back to God because he needed a a booster shot of praise and worship and communion and peace and end his day with joy and celebration. As was his custom from his early days. They knew what they were doing. And can't you see the group meeting outside the house? We're going to get him. We know him. We know what he's going to do. And when those doors flew open by the window and he's praying towards Jerusalem and they're saying, I see him. Witnesses, witnesses, we all see it. We know what he's doing. And they ran to Darius and said, Darius, you know what you said. You know what you wrote down. Can't pray to any other God making any other decisions other than you, just you. Yeah, I know what I wrote down. Well, that Daniel, one of those Furners that came in here. 
one of those guys that came in that you just keep giving uh, promotion after promotion after promotion to. I'm here to tell you, he's blaspheming you. He's praying to his God instead of praying to you. Oh, and that got all over Darius. He, be, he went back to his place and he began to, Lord, if there, what can I do? What can I do? Because he loved and respected Daniel. And at the end of the day, the sun, sun could not go down on, on disobedience. He could not let this happen. This could not be broken. There was no loophole around it. So Daniel was called. And Daniel was taken to that place. I love this. Darius says to him, Daniel, your God whom you serve continuously, may he take care of you. And they put him down in that lion's den. And they put the rock over it. By the way, doesn't that sound familiar? The rock being put over the door. The wax being sealed. He sealed it with his signet saying, it must be done this way. Daniel gets down there. I wonder, I've never heard anybody say this before, but I wonder if he's down there that night, I wonder if he got down on his knees and began to praise God as was his custom. Thank you, Lord, for being with me. Through the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe he quoted Psalms 23. <laughs> The Lord, my shepherd, is with me among these lions. And God met him there. By the way, God sent an angel to be there. And the troubles of this world, the hungry lions there, they cannot override the will of Almighty God. Charles Stanley said he wondered if Daniel may have curled up with one of those fluffy lions and used him for a fluffy pillow that night and had a good, night, good night's rest. I don't know. But let me tell you what I do know. The next morning, Darius had fasted all night. He just was so upset. And he runs to it and he has the stone moved and he cries out, Daniel, was your God able? <laughs> oh, King Darius, live forever. Daniel wasn't against Darius. <laughs> he was just seek, seeking to be obedient to his God. I love it. They pull him out of the lion's den, and there's not even a scratch on him. I like that. Not even a scratch from being thrown in. Not even a scratch from falling upon the rocks when they threw him in. No, no, no lion scratches or anything at all. And don't you know Darius' eyes got this big when Daniel came out? And all those people that were against Daniel, don't you know their eyes got this big too? And I tell you what, I, I, I need to read this to you because I want you to to hear what Darius said about this. Verse 25, King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nation, language that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. <laughs> Testify, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the ends. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on, on, on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Do you think that God allowed circumstances to happen in such a way because he knew that Daniel would be faithful to his spiritual disciplines, to trusting in God, to humbling himself, to coming before God and seeking him, Seeking to be close to the Father no matter what. Having his Gethsemane. His place where he can abide with the Father. No matter the circumstances. I don't believe Darius would have ever known otherwise. He may have heard of the power of God, but 
he got, to, he got to become an eyewitness of it firsthand. Would God so do a work like that in our lives? Are you listening, church? Those spiritual disciplines that Jesus followed, he followed every day. He didn't wait until the night before the cross to find his Gethsemane. He went as was his custom. Daniel didn't wait until the circumstance came up and then tried to get his heart right. He woke up every day seeking to follow God, get his heart right with God, do the things that God would have him to do. I believe in 2021, God's calling us to a personal relationship with him. I believe God's calling us to seek him like we never have before. I believe that there are some things that Jesus modeled in his life where he could have that abiding relationship that we need to make sure that we have in our lives as well. We need to be intentional about it. We don't need to let anything else come in the way. We need to choose today who we're going to serve. We need to make the decision now that as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. First, foremost, and always, it's Christ, Christ alone. Every decision that I make will be a godly decision. And every day, I will follow the spiritual di disciplines that help me get that, to that place. I don't know about you, but it's time. It's time for us to trust God and obey Him. Heads bowed. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for the invitation where you call us by name and you desire for to spend time with us. You desire for us to, to leave the place of this world and by prayer to enter into the throne room in glory to where we can lay our troubles and our worries and our burdens down. Father, they're not greater than you. You're greater than them. And Lord, may we walk into a relationship where we know that you have our back, you have our front, you are our everything. Every decision that we make, we must learn to trust you and fear you more than we fear man and trust you more than we do our own will and our own way. And Lord, to seek to be a tool in your hand where you can impact the world, the world, through a simple tool like us, given wholly to you. Father, begin the work. Begin it today. Begin it right now as we submit our lives to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.